Hey guys, this is Dieter from Cloud Economics US. Welcome to my channel. You can reach me on Twitter, over email, or in the comments down below. Today I'm going to answer the question, what is cloud? Let's take a look at it. Very simple, cloud computing is compute and storage as a service. That's it. Let's take a look at one of the principles of cloud computing. Let's for example assume that you own a single family home like this one shown here. And let's say that in your home you want electricity. There are multiple ways to do that. For example, you can purchase a generator. Now this generator will cost you some money. Also, the generator will need some kind of fuel. In addition, the generator will need occasionally some maintenance. Now this is just one single family home. Let's take a look at your neighbors. They need to do the same thing. Each neighbor needs to purchase a generator that costs money, consumes fuel and requires some maintenance. On the other hand, let's say that there is a power plant in your city. Sure, this power plant costs more money, requires more fuel and more maintenance. However, the upside is that all the houses in the neighborhood can simply connect to that power plant, do not need to worry about buying their own generators, fuel, maintenance. They simply pay for the power as a utility. They pay by the hour consumed. Jeff Bezos in 2006 called this the undifferentiated heavy lifting. What does it mean undifferentiated heavy lifting? Well, let's look at the example where you have a business and you're trying to do something very specific. Let's say write an app for a game. What you should really be focusing on is writing code for an app, for a game, not much else. You really don't want to be distracted with, hey, I need to rent some space in a data center, I need to purchase some hardware, I need to depreciate that hardware, the hardware then needs to be racked and stacked, it needs to be cabled, the operating system needs to be installed, and then finally I can install some code for my game. All of those things are not core to your business. They do not differentiate your business from any other business that is trying to do something similar, like writing apps for games. I didn't want this video to become too long, so I put a brief history of cloud computing into another video. Let's take a look at some of the computing trends that we can already observe. In the past, we had mainframe computers that were highly centralized. We moved from mainframes and centralized computing to a highly distributed system with the internet. With the arrival of cloud computing, we are seeing a trend going back to a centralized system in a sense, as the cloud is more similar to, let's say, a global data center. This lets us to reason that possibly after cloud, we are going to see a decentralized, a distributed system again, possibly with intelligent edge devices. Now let's take a look at what virtualization is. Data centers look like large warehouse style structures from the outside. There's really nothing much remarkable about the data center except that they require a huge amount of power, air conditioning, and sometimes have external structures for failover power supplies like diesel generators. On the inside, the layout of a data center is rows with racks, power, network, and air conditioning. A single server in a rack is called a server blade. This is a one unit blade of a fairly old server. You can see that the server has four central processing units or CPUs. 
What cloud providers typically do is they install a special type of operating system on those servers. An example of such an operating system is a Zen hypervisor. Such a hypervisor makes the underlying hardware look like a single virtual machine or VM. You can then install any type of operating system you desire on that virtual machine, for example Linux, Windows or whatever you like. A special property of those virtual machines is that they can be stopped, started or terminated. This is something that normal operating systems typically do not provide. Another property of a hypervisor is that multiple virtual machines can be running on the same physical hardware. In this example, there are two virtual machines running on the same physical server blade. There is really no limitation to how many virtual machines can be running on a physical server. In this example, we see 32 virtual machines running on the same physical hardware. Modern hypervisors allow different size of virtual machines to be running on the same hardware. In this example, we see half of a virtual machine, a quarter of a virtual machine and eight very small ones. For example, with Amazon Web Services, if we take the M5 family, we see here all possible virtual machine configurations. We see that the largest virtual machine that can run on the M5 hardware is an M5 24 extra large virtual machine. It happens to have 96 virtual CPUs and 384 gigabytes of RAM. So it is a fair bet that these are the characteristics of the underlying physical hardware. The smallest virtual machine that can run on this hardware is an M5 Large. It has just two virtual CPUs and 8 GB of RAM. When customers choose to start a virtual machine on the M5 physical hardware, they can choose from any of these available combinations. As you likely already know, there are multiple cloud providers that are active in the market. For example, we have Google, Azure and Amazon Web Services. There is really no size fits all. Some companies, they will be more of a Windows shop and they will feel at home with Azure. Other companies are going with Linux and they may choose Google or Amazon Web Services. There is also plenty of material out there talking about the pros and cons of all these cloud providers. For example, Gartner is ranking them in a magic quadrant. Gartner is actually a good source for getting started with an overview of specific cloud services, cloud providers like storage or whatnot. It's a good place to get started, to get you situated and to help you build an informed opinion. Many folks are going to talk about the different types of cloud services like infrastructure as a service, platform as a service or software as a service. These all really don't matter because at the end the cloud is something that you reach through a service. How you get there, not really all that important. But for completeness, just to mention that infrastructure as a service, a good example is a Google Compute Engine that provides virtual machines that we talked about earlier. Something that may be a little bit surprising for some of you, as platform as a service, Facebook is a good example. Developers can create specific applications for the Facebook platform using proprietary APIs. Last not least, software as a service. Here, Salesforce is a good example. It has a large online portfolio of customer relationship management or CRM software. Just as an example, I want to show you Amazon Web Services service offerings. Here you see a screenshot of all the different services that are available to you once you log into the AWS console. 
I tried to make the picture as large as possible, but I couldn't get all the different product offerings onto the screen. So there are very many of them, and that is fairly typical of the larger cloud providers. Let's finish up with some advantages of cloud computing. First, I want to mention capital expenditures being moved into operational expenditures. What does that mean? Well, it's similar to renting versus buying. Let's say you have a small business. Someone like a bank is taking a look at your financials and they see, hey, you know, this person or this business purchased a car, spent $20,000. And by looking at your financial statement of your business, um, someone like a bank sees that, hey, you know what? You spent $20,000 and your income is zero. So of course that person will be somewhat concerned. What is going on here? On the other hand, if you rent that car, there is a monthly expense, uh, let's say $500, and your financials don't look so bad anymore. We already talked about undifferentiated heavy lifting earlier in the video. However, the undifferentiated heavy lifting also has an effect of speeding up innovation. How does that work? Well, in this case, your staff can focus on what is important for your business. They do not get distracted by patching, security updates, node failures, any of those kind of things they don't need to worry about. So they can really focus on building new things that didn't exist before that give your business an advantage against your competitors. In my cost optimization in eight minutes video, I already talked a little bit about elasticity. For completeness, I want to mention that in a data center, you rent the space by the month, you purchase the hardware or rent the hardware also by time. And it doesn't really matter if something is turned on or off, the money that you spend is still the same, no difference. However, in cloud computing, you're paying by time used let's say by the hour, by the minute, by the second of a resource used, like a disk drive or a computer. So you have the typical advantages of elasticity, which is you can turn something off and not have to pay for it, something that you don't get in the data center. You can do vertical scaling, meaning if you need something slightly larger or slightly smaller, yes, it is available to you. You can do horizontal scaling, meaning you need 10 more, 20 more, 100 more of the same thing? No problem, your cloud provider will give it to you at a price. And the last property mildly related to elasticity is global presence. Typically, cloud providers have multiple locations around the planet. So if you need to be closer to your customers in Europe or in Asia, not a problem. Your cloud provider can help you with that. This concludes my cloud video. Thanks for watching. As always, please like or subscribe. This is a good way to provide feedback and show your support. Thanks again. Bye.